This is BoomerIncomeIdeas.com and your host, Dan Farnsworth. Hey, thanks for tuning in to this week's segment of BoomerIncomeIdeas.com. Uh, we're going to switch gears a little bit today. And uh, if you're the type of person who actually likes the more meat and potatoes type of business opportunities, I think you're going to find this pretty interesting. Uh, today, we're going to talk with Adam Blake, who is Vice President of Franchise Development at Filta Environmental Kitchen Solutions. That's a mouthful, but essentially they have a servicing niche in the restaurant environment. So let's welcome Adam to the show. I was looking for a business that was unique. I was looking for a business that was profitable. I was looking for a business with limited competition. I was looking for a business that I could start from home. I was looking for a business, but I found much more. I found Filta. Hey, Adam, thanks for joining me today. All right, Dan, it's good to, good to be here. You know, I like this company on a lot of different levels, which I'll talk about uh, down the road a little bit. But in the, before I do that, can you kind of give us a little bit of a background of what exactly Filta Environmental Kitchen Solutions is and what you guys do? Sure. Well, Filta was founded uh, just 20 years ago, actually, this year in the United Kingdom. And uh, our founders uh, actually identified uh, a gap and a need in the market through uh, an accident of a friend of one of the owners. And uh, this friend of his was actually tasked with uh, the job that so many people know and really despise, which was changing the fryer oil out. Um, it's a common job in the kitchen and actually one of the most dangerous. And while he was performing this task, he actually burned himself severely uh, all over his upper body. So and, you're so you're saying changing the fryer oil out in a restaurant in a commercial kitchen, correct? He was, in fact, uh, over there. It was in a small little fish and chip shops. Okay, uh, which was uh, or, or all over the place over there. So um, Jason, our founder, uh, during a cricket match, uh, learned of the accident, and he's always been of the inventor mentality. And so um, he just kind of immediately went to, well, there's got to be a safer and a, and a better way of doing this. So uh, at that time, what he did was came up with the idea for a machine that would be a safer way of getting the oil in and out of the fryer using a series of pumps and motors to pull the oil out of the top rather than draining it out of the bottom. And when he partnered up with our CEO, uh, Victor Clues, uh, they really dove into the kitchens to learn that, hey, you know, there's actually a greater need here than just swapping out the oil. There's a way that we can get the oil to last longer. And there's a way that we can actually take this job away from the kitchen staff completely. And at that time, the fryer management service, which we call filter fry was born. Okay. So you have people that go around to these commercial kitchens uh, in any kind of restaurant or any kind of environment where there are fry vats essentially and you extract the, the cooking oil, you clean the cooking oil, and you put it back. Is that correct? That's part of the service. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the unique aspect of the service. Uh, with the filtration that we do, we're pulling out particles on a molecular level, extending the useful life of the oil. Uh, so that's part of it. The other part uh, of the service is actually when the oil is no longer usable, when it can no longer be filtered or cooked with, uh, we'll remove the oil from the fryer, uh, and we'll return uh, basically fresh oil to the fryer. Each time we go in, uh, we, we do the job of cleaning and detailing the fryer for the customer as well. So we completely eliminate their staff from having to do that undesirable and that dangerous job, bringing in our people to do it with our specialized tools and equipment. I uh, mentioned that there's a lot of reasons why I like this company. And one that is kind of a personal thing for me is that when I was a kid, my father actually owned a fish and chip store. Okay. And I know how, uh, how really crummy it was to try to you know, work in that environment and, and work with that oil. And more importantly, I also know how important it was to keep that oil fresh because it really had an impact on the taste of, of, the, of the finished product. And so it was, a, it was a constant battle. And essentially what you're saying is that you take this away, you take all of that away from the restaurant operator or the commercial kitchen operator, and you guys do that, correct? 
that's essentially it. And I can't tell you how many conversations I have with people where their first job was in like McDonald's or Burger King. And, you know, that job typically goes to the low man on the totem pole. So it's the 16 year old kid that comes in one or two days a week. They throw the most dangerous job at the kitchen at this kid. And, you know, they get that kind of quality work out of it. So oftentimes we'll come in and we'll see pretty dirty, uh, pretty unsanitary situations that we kind of rebound and, and bring back. And you do this uh, through a, basically an army of franchisees. Is that correct? Correct. Correct. So uh, we've got uh, currently 135 franchisees spread over 40 states. And uh, Filta is now in 26 countries worldwide. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, so again, Number two reason why I really like this this business opportunity it's it's something that pretty much anybody can do. Uh, there's no you know PhD that's necessary to to actually do this job, but more importantly, it's also something that uh, an individual can do by himself, or he can create a team and grow a team. And equally important, one of the things that I really liked about uh, going through your your franchise videos was the the family element to it. It seemed like there was a, a real ability for the franchisee to get his family involved. And uh, in one case, uh, Joanne is the daughter of one of your franchisees, and she her job was to go out and line up new accounts. And she actually got into Fenway Stadium, so they have that that account. And, uh, and then they got their her little brother involved, and it just really seems to be a family situation. Do you find that uh, quite a bit? Uh, it's not not uncommon at all to have a family unit uh, kind of joining forces and, and everybody kind of using their strengths to build the business. Uh, one important part, uh, I think, to mention on that is you're right. This is uh, this is a business that anybody can do. You know, we have uh, people that have come out of IT. We have uh, commercial airline pilots. Uh, we have guys that have been out of the finance and banking world. And then we also, of course, have entrepreneurs and people who have owned other businesses as well. Um, but the, the benefit of the franchise system in this is we teach our owners everything they need to know. So when somebody comes on board uh, with Filta as a new owner, they immediately go through a two-week comprehensive training program. So they'll spend a week in the classroom kind of learning about the theories and processes and what fryer management is and how to operate the equipment. And then they go out and apply what they've learned in a, a setting with an existing franchise owner for a week in their business before then going home to open and launch their business. So uh, when it comes to learning about this business, no, I mean, we were the ones that invented it 20 years ago. So nobody comes with this wealth of fryer management knowledge. So everybody kind of starts on an equal playing field. Um, I guess the only people that would have any uh, benefit would be people like yourself who say, yeah, I remember doing this job and how much I hated it. So. Uh, you may have a little bit of a leg up going into a kitchen and saying, hey, I'm one a, a person that actually used to do this. Right. And here's why I know that you'll want to use this service and why it will be so beneficial to you. Number three on my list of things that I really like about it is there's really no competition, correct? There isn't. We have no organized competition. So there's no other major brand or player in the game. So what our owners really run up against is uh, just simply a, a lack of knowledge. Um, you know, when we come in and introduce our service, our customers have never heard about anything like this. You know, fryer management to them is, again, the 16-year-old kid, who, the part-timer who comes in and does this once or twice a week, depending on their needs. Um, so when we come in and say, hey, we've got an opportunity to take this job away from you, uh, we're going to provide you with consistently cleaner fryers, with a, a safer, more enjoyable work environment, more consistency to your food product. And we can do it in a cost-effective way by extending the life of your oil. It's kind of one of those things where sometimes when it sounds too good to be true. So uh, our job is simply to get them to understand that, hey, we've, what we can do for you is really better than what you can do for yourself. And we'd really like to show you rather than just telling you. Right. And that brings me to my next question. Can you kind of give me a day in the life uh, sequence of what a franchisee does uh, on a daily basis? Well, most of our franchise owners employ people. So uh, they're more of the manager slash developer role for their business. And that's actually what we want. Um, mm -hmm. We're really not interested in selling uh, somebody a job 
in this business. You know, we want to sell somebody the opportunity to build and, and grow something. And so there's a lot of programs there to help owners do that, uh, whether it's hiring, uh, whether it's sales, uh, whether it's scheduling, routing, accounting. We've got systems and programs for all of it. Um, but we really want our owners focused on uh, working on their business instead of in their business. Yeah. A normal day um, for an owner with an employee would be kind of customer relationship management. So they're going to go around and see their customers, visit them, make sure everything's going the way it should be going. They're going to be doing customer development, adding uh, new accounts to their businesses. And then uh, I'm sure one of your upcoming questions will have to do with the uh, multiple facets of our service. So we'll also see our owners while they're visiting their existing clients, talking to them about the other service offerings that we can bring to them to make their lives easier. And better. Yeah, well, that, that's a good lead. That's a good segue. So let's talk about the additional services besides actually uh, maintaining the FriVat itself. Uh, you have three more, uh, three additional services. Is that right? Uh, three and we'll have our fourth this year. Yes. Okay. So can you expand on that a little bit? Well, with the filter fry service, which is again our namesake and what we were founded with 20 years ago, uh, on average, we're visiting our customers about one to two times a week to provide this fryer management service. So what that enables us to do is really leverage a pretty solid relationship that we build with them. Uh, there are two services that kind of bolt on to the filter fry service. Uh, one being our filter bio service, which is the binless removal of waste oil. And the other is our filter gold service, which is the delivery of fresh oil. <clears throat> with uh, the way that the customers currently deal with their oil is they'll buy their oil from a big provider like their Cisco or their U.S. Foods type distributors. And they'll uh, buy it in bulk store it in their kitchens and it'll take up shelf space and the jugs weigh 35 pounds each and their staff will have to carry them around and lift them and pour them. So with the filter gold service, what we do is because we're managing the fryers, we have the ability to bring the oil with us, fill up their fryers on the day that they need to be filled and take the waste jugs with us and basically eliminate the uh, cooking oil footprint in their kitchen. So they can get all that shelf space back. They can use it for food or whatever they need it for. And the customer no longer has to worry about ordering their oil in bulk and worrying about if they have too much or too little or when they run out because we're the ones taking uh, taking care of that for them. On the back, uh, our fill to bio service is really kind of revolutionary. We're the only ones in this field as well. Um, we're the only company that can remove waste oil without the bin. And uh, you may or may not remember from your experience back when, but when the oil was drained out of the fryer, it had to go somewhere. And typically that somewhere is some type of drum or receptacle that's out by the dumpster location. And anybody that's ever been behind a restaurant has probably smelled that area because it's one of the most horrific smells that uh, you can probably experience. And what it is, is it's the deteriorating waste oil in that area. Mm -hmm. Because those bins are left outside, they're exposed to the sun and the heat and water and rain and snow and everything else, and they just, it's a deteriorated product. So what we tell the customer is, hey, look, instead of having that kind of, we call it a sanitation nightmare behind your kitchen, why don't you get rid of the bin and we can take the oil right from the fryer. We've got a tank built right into the back of our van and at the end of every service, we can haul it away and we'll deal with discarding it for you. Uh, specify that when you sell that, basically you're selling that to become biodiesel. Is that correct? How large is the typical territory? Well, territories range in size depending on their concentration, population, and uh, number of potential accounts within them. Um, I'd call an average territory about the size of a county. Mm -hmm. uh, when you get into more metropolitan markets, the, the uh, territories will shrink. Uh, so, for example, um, uh, Orlando, which is where our headquarters is, uh, the Orlando market or Orange County is actually four different territories, whereas the state of Montana is two territories. Right. I got it. Okay. Why isn't this more popular? Well, from the franchising standpoint, um, we're not your major player out there. We're not adding hundreds of franchise owners every year. Uh, we have a very moderate schedule of growth. Uh, in fact, it, 
contrary to what people would think our, when our, our owners are asked, what do you see in the future for your business? Their answer is less franchisees owning larger businesses. Uh, and there's a number of reasons behind that, but uh, this is a very kind of moderate paced franchise. So we are uh, kind of the slow and steady approach and it's because seeing a customer as frequently as we do, it's more important to make sure that a relationship is sound for the long-term success of the franchisee. Uh, we want to make sure our franchisees aren't growing too fast and losing half of the customers that they put on because they're just moving at a pace that isn't sustainable. We'd much rather them go that slow and steady approach to where five years from now, the customers that they started with are still on and they're growing and scaling to multiple vans and multiple units. Got it. I mentioned at the beginning that this is a business that pretty much anybody can do, but who should not be doing it? I mean, what, who, who is not a good candidate uh, for this business? Uh, you need to be able to communicate in this business. Um, there are people we find that tend to be made for kind of a retail type business where they do a bunch of advertising and people come to them. Uh, this is not that business. Now, uh, anybody can do the, the business that has the ability and the desire, uh, but I would say for some people, a business like ours would really be jumping out of their comfort zones. And we have kind of a phrase that we talk about in our discovery process, which is we can teach the owner exactly what to say when they get out of the van. What we can't teach them to do is get out of the van. <laughs> yeah. So if somebody thinks they'll have trouble getting out of the van, um, this might not be a good fit for them. Um, and it, the only other option would be they'd have to have the wherewithal to be able to employ somebody to do that part for them. Uh, that sales is the big part of our business. I, yeah, I can I can definitely see this. I I, I always subscribe to uh, uh, to the saying that if you can't cook, don't open a restaurant, and uh, if you can't sell don't think that you're going to hire someone to do that for you. I mean, at some point, you need to be able to jump in there and do it yourself because uh, that sales guy that you're hiring uh, might take off and your, your, your business is, is stopped at that point. So it's, uh, it, it seems to me that that is really a critical component to this, that that person needs to be able to go out, make the calls, interface with, uh, with customers, and, and sell this product. Is that right? It is. Um, you know, people come to the uh, come to me often and say, you know, I can just see this as something that sells itself. <laughs> and I'd love to say yes, it does, but, but at the same time, it requires that that outward uh, ability. You know, it requires people that can, you know, when they get a no, they know that no just means no today, and they'll revisit that customer again in the future. And it's not, you know, the world doesn't come crashing down on them because someone told them no and they took it personally. And, and on the same token, we're talking about, you know, uh, a, a good amount of money to invest in a franchise. You know, uh, I'm sure that was going to be one of your questions as well, is what's the investment level? And, and we consider ourselves on the more affordable side. How much of that uh, could be financed? Yeah, we've got some partners uh, on the financing side that with a qualifying credit, um, can easily finance uh, the entire purchase okay. uh, through an SBA Express loan. Um, we've had a lot of success with those through the years. Uh, again, uh, it's a program unique to a business of our uh, kind of size and, and uh, investment level. Mm -hmm. um, for those that want to contribute some of their own equity to the business, uh, we have leasing programs as well through some of our partners where they can lease the van, they can lease a portion of our equipment. Um, you know, kind of lowering the cost of entry and, and allowing them to spread that out rather than maybe just financing the entire thing if they weren't comfortable doing that. Okay, excellent. So you are SBA approved and, and uh, you have that in place as well as uh, alternative leasing or, or alternative forms of financing, including leasing, so that uh, someone coming into this business basically could come in with some capital for operating purposes and essentially finance the balance. Uh, is that correct? Absolutely. Well, Adam, this has been a great conversation. I'm, I'm impressed with this, and we're going to make sure that we have uh, links to your page and your phone number and so forth in our notes section 
so what I want to do basically is say thank you very much for uh, joining us today, and uh, I, I appreciate your time, and hopefully we'll uh, be sending some, some uh, future franchisees your way. Well, I hope so, too, and uh, the pleasure's all mine. I appreciate you having me on. Thanks for joining us on this episode. I hope that you found it informative. Uh, please uh, check out the notes section for more links and relevant information. And if you like what you've seen, please make sure that you uh, like us on Facebook and also subscribe so that you're up to date on a weekly basis of what we're doing. Thanks again. Hope to see you next week.